We've just launched Veridictum, which is a smart ownership and distribution platform for film and video producers to protect them from theft and piracy and looking at some new distribution models. And basically, the blockchain is something that is amazing technology. I, I mean, I'm very passionate about it, but the issue is that so much of the, the media coverage and all the venture capital and that sort of thing, which we'll look at today, has gone into fintech, into financial technology. And we're focusing on tonight on very much stuff outside of fintech because that's where uh, there's not a great deal of information around there. And it's just to try and give you a bit of a, a business idea of where this is coming from. Now, my background is business rather than being a techie techie. I know what the technology can do and what it needs to do for a client. But I, I mean, the amount of coding I've done is limited to Excel and VBA and those sorts of things. So any technical questions, Ron is going to be ably placed to answer those questions. Um, I, you know, but I will certainly try and see what we, can, what we can actually do. For me, this statement that came out from Goldman Sachs probably in about December last year reflects really where the blockchain is in terms of the blockchain can change, well, everything. And we'll actually see tonight, um, just with a bit of lateral thought, how true that statement is. So I guess the first question I want to ask is, what year did you come across the internet for the first time? So let's start at around, say, 1999. Who first discovered it in 99? Okay, well, we'll, we'll go down from there. 98? 97? 96? 95? Okay, a few. 94? Anybody before 94? All right. Okay. All right. Well, Ron, okay. Uh, that was about 1961 or something, was it? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. No, that's a, that's a gross <laughs> insult, isn't it? Sorry, that wasn't meant that way. I mean, I came across the internet. Huh? 78. Jeez. Okay. Was that the ARP network and that sort of thing? All right. Okay. I mean, I came across the internet in 1995. It was actually February the 12th, 1995, at 2.16 p.m. in the afternoon. I remember that cathartically, because I'm a POM, can't do anything about it. But I went to an internet provider in the south coast of England, Brighton, and came across the internet, and we connected via a 14 4K modem. Anybody remember those? I'm sure a few people do. And we connected to an, uh, an art gallery that was 10 kilometers away, and there was one line at a time, up came this image of a painting. And I said, I have got to be in this business. And we set up an internet cafe bar and restaurant and a web design house, which we sold in 2001. But at that time, email was the first wave of uh, the internet-based technology. TCP IP was the underlying technology. And of course, we all know how things have changed. I mean, if we just think of all these names that have come up in the past 20 years, that's how dramatically the, the technology has changed. Now, when I saw the blockchain, I had the feeling of deja vu. I'd, I'd looked at Bitcoin. I'd never traded it or bought them. I knew roughly what it was, but never got into it until August last year. And I looked at the blockchain and I thought, oh my God, I have got to get in this business. And I guess the key thing is, where is right now is like the internet was in 95. It's raw, but it's absolutely full of potential. And if anybody's looking at the, the blockchain for business ideas or anything like that, it is unbelievable the potential that exists. The, the biggest thing that I would countenance for you is that once you start exploring down the rabbit hole of the blockchain, you will never come back. It is a phenomenal, you go deep and you go wide, and once you understand what's going on, you'll really appreciate its power. So, I'll, I'll keep it really light in, in relation to what is blockchain, because there are a few people that don't uh, understand it. For those that do already, I apologize, but we'll, I'll try and keep it really light. I guess the, the issue is that last December, I was at the blockchain workshops in Sydney, and I actually asked delegates... Yeah, as we were networking, that sort of thing, in five words, summarize the blockchain. And it's almost impossible to summarize it in, in, in five words. I mean, if you remember when the internet first came out, people said the information superhighway, it then became new media, everybody got it. You can understand it, the media understood it. 
But you've probably heard of things like distributed ledger technology and, and crypto 2.0. There are lots of different descriptions that absolutely mean nothing. Nobody's really got a handle on, on describing what it is. So let's just look at what it is from a practical perspective. Now, let's say that I steal Daniel's phone. All right? Under normal circumstances, to actually establish the truth of that as to you know, whether I did steal it or not, we'd normally go to a court of law and we'd thrash it out. The judge would say, yeah, go for your life. Yes, it was you that stole it, or maybe, maybe you didn't. But if we actually had the situation where there were 5,000 photographers that took a picture of me stealing Daniel's phone, then that's pretty conclusive proof that I stole his phone. Because if I had to actually go and talk to all 5,000 of those photographers, it would take me an eon to do. It would take me a lifetime, to, or it would take me a long time to do it. There is this thing called consensus which exists within the blockchain. Don't worry too much about it, but it's more or less where the majority of people say, yes, this is, this is correct information. So in this particular case, you know, 2,500 people at least have got a photograph of me stealing uh, Daniel's phone. But we've got 5,000 photographers. Now let's say... I have to change those 5,000 photographs in 10 minutes. So I've got to go around and persuade 5,000 people at the same time that the photograph is, you have to change the photograph. And let's say after 10 minutes, those 5,000 photographs are put into a bank vault. And once they're in the bank vault, they're locked, and there's the, the locks on the actual door for the bank vault have more combinations than there are grains of sand on the planet. So let's then take the extension that we've got those 5,000 photographs inside the bank vault. We've got a camera inside that will actually show us that information. So basically, that is what the blockchain is all about. Except, instead of the 5,000 photographers, you have 5,000 computers, independent computers around the world, called nodes. Don't worry about the technology, just understand there are 5,000 computers. And instead of it being a photograph, it's actually data. So data is actually housed on all those 5,000 independent computers, but they're locked completely you know, and sealed with more combinations than there are grains of sand on the planet. Now, the issue is that those, the, the blocks of data are actually put together, and they're cryptographically sealed. Now, under the Bitcoin blockchain, which I, I won't go into a lot of depth, but just to suffice to say... There's a mathematical puzzle that people have to solve, and for solving it, under the Bitcoin blockchain, they actually earn Bitcoin. Don't want to get too heavily involved in it, just want to give you an idea of, of where we're at. And then those blocks are actually all on the same 5,000 computers independently, and the idea is that every 10 minutes, that block, the block of data is added to the previous block, until you get to a point where it's 51% consensus. And what it means is that the data is permanently locked. It is what is known as immutable. It cannot be changed. Like the photographs inside the vault, 5,000 photographers, those can't be changed. This data cannot be changed. And that's the real power of the blockchain. Now, just with the, the Bitcoin blockchain, the final thing is that the, the public blockchain contains every single transaction that has gone on on the Bitcoin network since it started in 2009. So, it's ideal for financial services. And I will get out my trusty 50 buck note here, okay? Now, if I'm feeling generous and I decide to give you this 50, this $50 note, the issue is, if I give it to you, there's then the, the, there's a permanent record that you've got my $50 note. If I give this to, to Sean, I'm going to give it to him right now because he's a, he's a good fella. All right? So I've given him my $50 note. Now, in digital, everything is, is we can copy everything. We just you know, right-click and we can copy a photograph, we can copy a Word document, that sort of thing. In financial services... You know, we've got to actually overcome that problem of how do I actually duplicate that $50 note digitally if that was the case. And that's where the strength of the blockchain via Bitcoin has been. That every single transaction has, that has ever existed has actually been recorded so you can identify that if I've actually given uh, Sean 50 Bitcoin, then I can't give it to somebody else. 
And that's the really important part for financial services. That's why all this money has actually been invested in the, the fintech space. Now, I'll just, get, just take that 50 bucks back so I can invest it in my own fintech startup, and that'll pay for my food on the way home. Right, so, I mean, as it stands at the moment, up until literally uh, early April, $1.1 billion has been invested in the Bitcoin and blockchain space, but it's been mainly finance. So what we want to do is look at other stuff. So how many, how many people have either bought a diamond or been given a diamond recently, say in the past two years? Three years? Anybody, or anybody bought a diamond or... There's got to be some romance here somewhere. Okay, there's some, some vague hints of romance just down there. All right. What about blood diamonds? Anybody familiar with blood diamonds? Anybody know what a blood diamond is? Yeah, it's often out of sort of war-torn regions where they've been smuggled out and they're funding the, the diamonds. And so one of the big problems that's been, been looked at, for example, is if you actually were going to buy a diamond on eBay, because I mean, the last diamond that was bought was three years ago, I think, from here, so obviously we've got to rekindle romance here. So if there, was a, if there was a diamond on eBay, how many of you would buy a diamond off eBay for $5,000 right now? Well, put your hand up if you wouldn't buy it categorically. Okay. All right, let me ask you the question. Why not? Why wouldn't you buy the, the diamond off eBay? Right, okay. It's fundamental because we don't have a, an element of trust about who we're actually buying from, essentially. So, one of the things about the blockchain, and this is just this is the last bit of technical stuff, uh, honestly. One of the key things about this sort of summary diagram of the, of the blockchain, one of the things that's really important is this thing called the time stamping. So we can actually time stamp a particular event or any information that we actually want to lock to the blockchain. And that becomes really important because it looks at the issue of provenance. And this is becoming a very big feature in the, you know, on the blockchain in non-fintech. So, Provenance looks at the place of origin or earliest known history of something like the blood diamonds. If it's come from a war-torn region, it's illegal, it's also unethical. Or it looks at the recording of ownership of a piece of art, and it's the idea that you can track ownership. And the blockchain can actually define ownership, and this is where it becomes really, really strong. And just going back to the, the diamond idea... There's a really, really great company out of London, which is actually run by an Aussie woman, and it's called Everledger. And what these guys do is they look at the provenance of diamonds, because each diamond actually has, I think they take 45 pieces of metadata from each diamond that reflects exactly what that diamond is. And they've liaised and with all the diamond merchants in Antwerp, in New York, and this type of area, with the idea of defining the ownership and provenance of those diamonds, where those diamonds have actually come from. The problem they're trying to solve is that fraud is, is a massive problem, blood diamonds is a massive problem, insurance companies getting claims for stolen diamonds, it's a massive, massive problem. So they've worked on this particular side. And the key thing about provenance is that can actually be extended to Property. Are there any lawyers in the room? I know besides Sean, who's a lawyer. Anybody else a lawyer? Okay. I'm glad you're here because uh, I thought there might be more lawyers because uh, the legal profession is going to be one of the biggest disrupted by the non-fintech type of um, outside of, uh, uh, yeah, with the blockchain outside of fintech. And there's a company called Factum, which is a Texas-based company. And they are working, they've been working with the Honduran government on a proof of concept for removing land title fraud. The history of where this has come from is that Honduras uh, has got some beautiful, beautiful properties. I mean, I've never been to Honduras. I've just seen photographs and I've been deeply envious. But the World Bank decided to digitize all their manual records. And so what they did, they spent $100 million um, with you know, looking at digitizing these records. And a number of the governmental officials suddenly finished up with beachfront properties and properties that were rather nice beyond their pay grade. And so this was a major, major problem. So in terms of provenance, if one can actually identify the ownership, 
can identify the time stamping at which a property was actually transferred, it actually means that you can minimise the amount of, of land title fraud. I mean, from the legal side, do you do any conveyancing at all? Right, okay. No, I, I mean, I'm just curious if you, uh, if you do that. I mean, conveyancing is a... Uh, uh, I mean, there's so much paperwork that's, that's around and it's just so inefficient. This, this whole concept of Factum we're working on is designed to just make it a very clear and transparent view for land title. And these are the, just some of the working documents that they're, they're looking at. They're definitely worth checking out. Taking this a bit further, there is a company out of Berlin called Ascribe. And what these guys do which I think is kind of cool. Is anybody into art? Anybody an art collector? Anybody like art generally? All right, generally like art. One of the beauties is that with artworks, sometimes it's very hard to identify the, the provenance and ownership. So what these guys do is that they actually register the, the ownership. And you'll see on the bottom of this certificate of authenticity their cryptographic stamp. Now, what this means, which I think is very, very cool, is that if there are digital artists, for example, because the issue historically is you can just right-click and save an image and copy an image, these guys can identify the ownership of uh, an artist. They can identify, for example, if this was a limited edition digital piece of art. So the idea is they can legitimately because they can show the ownership and the provenance of where that piece of art has come from and who's actually bought it for them, it actually means that digital artists have now got a secondary market for digital artworks, which never existed before, all because of the blockchain. From our side, we're looking at, at videos. For example, I mean, we just take a video, we hash the actual file, we encrypt it with a unique identifier, and what we do is fingerprint the video linked to that identifier to, pre to prevent theft and piracy. And this is an area that, uh, that we're driving on, but this, I'm uh, just, just trying to sort of paint the idea of where the technology is coming from more than just selling what we're doing. How many of you like organic food? A few. How do you know that your food is organic? I mean, either of you two. Certification from, from what? Okay, I, mean, I think the Sword Association. Is it the Sword Association? I'm, but if you imagine, because we're actually looking at the provenance of assets historically, this can actually be extended to look at the, the, the supply chain. So, for example, if you were actually very, very keen on organic food, and particularly keen on it, it can be the situation that you can, via the blockchain, it can be identified which farmer produced it, which manufacturer actually processed it, who the retailer is, and ultimately through to the, the consumer, just by identifying the provenance of where that material has actually come from. And this is actually starting to become a major building area, uh, mainly out of Europe, I have to say. And there's, uh, there's a company called Literary Provenance that have just got a white paper out just now looking at this whole idea of organic food. So if you had clear identification that you could validate just by, for example, you know, taking a, a picture of the QR code, you could see exactly where everything came from. That would probably give you the confidence to, to know that it's, it's truly organic food. What about uh, designer bags? How many people have bought a fake bag? In Bali, come on, I have. Uh, yeah, not for me, I have to say, but it's... There's only one, I, th I think that, yeah. That's okay, I won't tell, I promise. Oh no, this is going out live on, oh dear, that's on Periscope. Uh, I could be having a few problems then, couldn't I? But, but the idea is, again, one can look at the provenance of designer bags. You can look at the supply chain. And so, as a result, there's a company called Block Verify. They've just won a pitching award uh, the week before last over in London where they are actually tagging, they're putting a tag into genuine bags to show where the actual bags have come from, from a, uh, a product provenance point of view. And so what it means is it's, it's going to hit 
the, the counterfeit markets quite substantially if they get it right. Okay, and these are all sorts of things that the, the blockchain can do. Now, this is perhaps where the you know, one of the strongest future areas of the blockchain is, and it's sort of smart contract contracting. Now, Ron's already alluded that he's got a number of uh, workshops on the smart contracting side, so if you, need, if you want to look at further in-depth information, then it's, it's worth going to Ron's, uh, Ron's course. But just to sort of give you an idea of what smart contracts are, if you think of the good old vending machine, a vending machine is essentially a smart contract. And the idea is that if you actually want to buy something from a vending machine, you put your money into the vending machine, you, you check that the item is actually available, you hit the button, bang, away it goes, it delivers the product, end of story. So essentially, you've actually put your money in and the product then comes out. And it's very, the actual vending machine does all the work. And a smart contract essentially is the same but is put onto the blockchain. And it is essentially programmable money with the ideas that cryptocurrencies can automatically execute against given criteria. It could be GPS coordinates. So if you're actually, if you're involved in international trade and you're bringing product in from China or something like that, once it comes into Australian waters, bang, it can identify, yes, it's in Australian waters, bang, payment gets shipped out. It could be Canada dates, you know, if that's a particular sale of a property or sale of a, a stock or, a, or, or something along those lines. I mean, you can basically program it for anything. I mean, one of the things that we're doing, for example, is we're looking at the allocation of music rights for videos. So if a, a video content producer has bought in some music, we want to automatically kick out music to the, to the music producers directly from the payments received from the video, because that's a major problem that exists right now. But it's the idea of programmable money. And it's, uh, it's interesting some of the actual things that are being developed right now by some major, major players. They are, for example, looking at smart contracts for car in the form of smart leases. Now, it, it's, it's a gray area of financial services and, and product, but I'll give you an idea of what this is about. So this is a nice sort of uh, concept car, be nice to have. The issue is, let's suppose that we lose our jobs and we can't afford to pay the repayments. The finance companies have developed a proof of concept that actually says to the car itself, right, because these payments have not been made, the key will no longer work. So the actual key to this car will no longer enable the driver to actually drive it, so it's parked in the driveway. But of course, the repro guys will have a key that will enable them to automatically get in to actually open the car. That's actually being developed right now. All linked in to what we'll come on to in a second, which is a thing called the Internet of Things. There's, uh, um, if you want to do a bit more research on this, because this is only a 45 minute talk, but Ethereum is the, the name to look at on smart contracts. They have developed a complete platform linking into smart contracts, so you can get a lot better idea of what's going on on that. So that's a definite reference point for further information. Anybody a sailor? Anybody been sailing? This is actually a picture from the Cape of Good Hope, and it's the idea that there are two oceans that, that collide. That's where the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic meet, and it tends to be incredibly rough. And one of the major areas that's actually going to happen is that the blockchain is going to converge with the IoT, with the Internet of Things. And that's where you get massive disruption. It's like two oceans actually colliding. Now, is, anybody, is, is, is there anybody who's not sure what the Internet of Things is? Anybody want me just to give a quick definition of it? Your smartphone is a thing that is the Internet of Things. It's where articles are actually connected to the Internet. Okay, so it can be phones. I mean, literally in, uh, in New York now, for example, they've got the, what do you call it, the manhole covers are actually connected to the Internet so they can see how many cars are going over them and, and all sorts of stuff. But the Internet of Things is a major, major area that's, that's going to sweep through in the next two to three years. 
and indeed Cisco have actually put out lots of marketing material that they they reckon that the number of connected internet devices is going to be 50 billion by the by 2020 we're at about just around the sort of around this the the seven to eight billion items connected I mean it's very very hard to judge how many there are uh, but it's around sort of seven billion or so right now uh, there are some numbers coming out that saying this could be even bigger and the Internet of Things and smart contracts comes together with these guys. Now, if there's only one company you look at for smart contracting and the Internet of Things, these are the guys to look at. They are based out of Germany, a company called Slocket. And you can see at the bottom there, they actually have a door lock. Nothing particularly exciting about the door lock, but the issue is that this is that they're in discussions with Airbnb, all right? Because the actual door lock itself actually has built within it smart contracts with the idea that you actually pay a deposit, for example, to the lock itself. The lock then, after you've actually done, you've know, had your, your stay in Airbnb or indeed with uh, a bike lock and a whole variety of other locks that they've developed, the idea is that it then automatically equates out of your deposit how much you owe and refunds the deposit to you. It's all done automatically within the lock itself. So these are, I mean, they're, they're looking at, uh, at items for you know, renting out bikes and cars and a whole variety of areas, but they're very much linking in smart contracts through to Ethereum so that the lock itself is actually being paid. In what way? Yeah, oh no, absolutely. I mean, I mean, there, there will be there will be risks associated with the contract, and I mean that's where with any lawyers, um, lawyers are going to have a field day if they understand smart contracts. Um, because what there'll be areas in uh, property, in smart contracts, this is where they can really excel. You're absolutely right. Because, uh, I mean, if the, if a, uh, you know, it does bring a number of issues out. For example, with the, the self-driving cars, for example, it's the same sort of issue. If a self-driving car has a crash, who do you sue? You know? It becomes, do you sue the software developer? Do you sue the driver? You know, all sorts of things are going to be coming out as major, major issues over the next few years. And uh, you know, there are people thinking about it, but nobody can, nobody's really sort of nothing that out. So as a lawyer, there's plenty and plenty of opportunities in smart contracting. You're smiling. You're going to get your diamond pretty soon, aren't you? I can tell. Huh? All right. Yeah. So, the Internet of Things and smart contracts. I mean, this is, I'm just touching the surface on this, this whole area. But this is all how blockchain is actually linking into Internet of Things. And it's really interesting. This article literally came out only uh, last week where Airbnb in the States have actually hired all the development team behind a Bitcoin service called ChangeTip because Airbnb are actually looking at, at their business model because they're worried about being disrupted themselves. And the same with Uber. I mean, Uber have disrupted the taxi industries, but they're going to potentially be disrupted by this technology. And that's why Airbnb have just announced, I think it's about 13 developers they've taken on this Bitcoin startup. So where's all this heading? I guess a lot of these are proof of concepts. You know, slowly these things are coming into the marketplace. But I guess it's just best to understand, again, it's raw but full of potential. And I guess, you know, because we looked at the fintech side of things, there's about 1.1 billion invested altogether. These, this is the non-financial blockchain, yeah, blockchain ecosystem, and it's a, loss, a lot less competitive. So if you've got any ideas relating to anything to do with the blockchain outside of fintech, now is the time to set it up. There's so much less competition because 90 to 95% of all the media coverage is in fintech. 
to be honest. That's why, I've, even though I've got almost 20 years' experience in financial services, that I've gone into video because that's where there's less competition and more chance to, to get something out there effectively. So it does come back to this original statement. Blockchain can change everything. And hopefully you can get a, a bit of a better idea of how that is. And the potential to disrupt is absolutely everywhere. And I actually do like this quote from Ted Turner, even though the guy himself I'm not particularly keen on. And it is one of those things, do something, either lead, follow, or get out of the way. And I guess the question I would leave you just to think about is, what will you do? Okay. And that is it. <laughs>